Welcome to the final session of the 2020 Global Marathon. My name is Mimi Irvin, and I'm the chair and host of this year's Global Marathon. It's certainly been an encouraging week, and I'm looking forward to introducing you to today's inspiring speakers. If you've joined us over the last five weeks, you know that this year's marathon is all about the common factors that motivate women to stay in engineering and technology despite the odds. Last year, Discover E and their partner, Concord Evaluation Group, set out to identify these shared characteristics through a research review exploring why young women choose engineering and what makes them persevere. We've shaped each session of the marathon around their findings, and we hope that our speakers will help you think about what can help you persist in your career and how we can work together to build staying power for women in engineering and tech. We've learned that feeling a sense of belonging in a community of engineers can be critical for women to persist in the field. Even more, feeling a sense of belonging is fundamental to our fulfillment and well-being. Building meaningful relationships opens new doors, reduces the intimidation factor we can often feel, and helps us find support. Today's speakers will talk to us about how they've built their own support networks and found a sense of community and feeling of belonging. Let's meet them. As the president and CEO of the Anita Board Institute for Women and Technology, Telly Whitney served to increase the representation of women technologists in the global workforce. To name just a few of her accomplishments, Telly co-founded the Grace Hopper Celebration of Women in Computing Conference, serves on numerous advisory boards, and has received a number of awards for her outstanding work supporting women in technology. My name is Telly Whitney. I'm a computer scientist an entrepreneur and a leader, best known as the co-founder of the Grace Hopper Celebration. I am, I'm gonna talk a bit about my own story and some of the lessons that I learned along the way with the hope that it would be useful to you. You know, I, I was really blessed to find computer science. I was very excited about it. I felt like I had found where I really belonged and I wanted to make a difference. I wanted to make contributions. And so when I arrived in Silicon Valley, I was passionate about creating products. But I had just arrived from Caltech, which at the time was only 13% women. And so I was also desperate to meet other technical women. I, I worked in semiconductors. I built some really interesting products, that uh, one of them a voice over IP processor and many other things. I started by meeting a bunch of women that came out of Stanford who all knew each other. And through them, I connected with other people. And in particular, I met a woman named Anita Borg. Anita had just arrived in Silicon Valley, similar as time to me, from New York. And certainly that early community was how I learned that we're better together. Anita and I worked together on many things, in particular a few years after I met her. She went to a systems conference and the women there created this, this list, an email list called Sisters. And it was initially for women and systems to stay connected, but it grew and it became a nurturing online community for all kinds of women who worked in IT or computing. It's in fact, it's still in use today. It was a place where women could go to get technical advice or to talk about career advice or questions like my boss, he did X, Y, Z, and I'm not quite sure how to behave. And you would always find a nurturing and warm environment. And so that was my early experience of how that it's important to come together. Anita and I talked a lot about celebrating the achievements of women. And in the early 90s, we decided to create a conference called the Grace Hopper Celebration of Women in Computing. Neither one of us had created a conference. And we got together in Palo Alto with a blank sheet of paper and looked at each other and just decided to go. Um, that first Grace Hopper Celebration was held in Washington, D.C. 
It was supported fiscally by a, an organization called CRA, the Computing Research Association, which has an extraordinary group called Computing Research Associates Women. They supported us. ACM supported us. They're the Professional Society of the Computing Community. And NSF, the National Science Foundation, provided scholarships for students. The first conference was about 500 people. Every woman that we asked to speak said yes. And in fact, the Turing Award, which is the Nobel Prize of the computing community for all of the community, computing community, has only had three women who received the Turing Award. And all three of those women were scheduled to speak at that first Grace Hopper celebration. But what I remember the most was standing at the hotel up on the balcony. Anita and I were looking at all these women streaming in, more women than I had ever seen in my entire life. And as I looked down on them, I thought, this is my tribe. It was very successful. And in fact, we continued to hold the Grace Hopper celebration every three years. I was at a startup company building a processor called a voice over IP processor, and Anita founded a nonprofit. She called it the Institute for Women in Technology. But shortly thereafter, Anita was diagnosed with brain cancer. And so here I was. Anita wanted me to take over this nonprofit. The board of trustees really wanted me to take it on. It was in serious trouble. It had really not had a chance to blossom. And my best friend was dying. My entire identity was around technical contributions. I had really, that was what I had worked on every, at all points till then. But I made a decision and I became the CEO of the Anita Borg, of what became the Anita Borg Institute. It was challenging. It was, it was hard. The board and I weren't sure it was going to survive. My experience, my scrappiness, my persistence that I had developed with startups played an important role of trying to help it helped the nonprofit figure out what it wanted to be when it grew up. And so at first we just barely survived, but there was a lot of support for this work. It played a really important role for women to be able to tell their story. And so after a few years, we thrived. The Grace Hopper celebration grew, it grew consistently and systematically grew. And then at some point, it really reached a touch point where people really wanted to come together in community. The students from the academic institutions, women working in industry, faculty, they would come together. And so the Grace Hopper scaled, the Grace Hopper conference scaled. And last year, the Grace Hopper celebration held with 26,000 people. It's an unbelievable experience. You need to make sure that the products that you have, including the Grace Hopper Celebration, meets the need of the people that you're serving. And in this case, the, the conference was designed by women for women. So 75% of the content is, is submitted, it's people people design their own content. And so there was a real sense of ownership of what we were producing. It wasn't just us talking to them. The other point is that many universities found that it made a huge difference with their students. So more and more universities sent their students to attend. But really why the conference grew so substantially is that companies Initially, they would come just to recruit the students, so they would send a few people to recruit. But they increasingly found that their technical population, it really helped them with retention. And so companies ended up sending more and more of their own employees. And in fact, this year, the conference sold out in half, half an hour. 
there's a lot of demand for it. And it's this, I mean, if you talk to women who are fans of the Grace Hopper celebration, there's a real sense of ownership. This is mine. This is for me. The position I had before I went to Anita Borg was as VP of engineering at a startup. So I had some exposure in terms of running at least a decent sized team. Um, but the, the position I had at Anita Borg called for a lot more public speaking and a lot more being out in front of everybody. And I, I had some skills that I needed to develop and I knew I did. So along the way I hired, I've actually hired a number of speaking coaches that have worked with me over the years and they helped. I mean, I learned a lot about putting together a talk. I've learned a lot about presenting, but it was really about practicing spending a lot of time doing a lot of speeches that you get to be better. But I think the other part about moving to the C-suite is that you are talking to a lot of very senior people. Our board of trustees grew very large and these were very senior executives from many companies. And you have to get comfortable with just being yourself but also delivering value uh, in people who are used to, to being very busy. And that, once again, that just takes practice. As I was trying to navigate making this nonprofit successful, I had this remarkable board of trustees that was very committed, including Maria Clave. Maria was, is now the president of Harvey Mudd and has done a lot of work in universities about increasing the the participation of women in computing. And Anita was the best friend of Maria and me. We didn't know each other that well, but we came together and with all these other wonderful board members, we were able to make it work. And we did it in Anita's memory. It was a very um, wonderful, hard, exciting time. I was CEO for 15 years. Who knew? I thought that I was going to work in technology and here I was creating a nonprofit. I stepped down at the end of 2017, but I continue to mentor CEOs of other nonprofits to work with companies that want to have more women in technology. And I continue to find that it's much better if we do it together. I've had many mentors and sponsors along the way. My PhD thesis advisor was an important sponsor as well as a mentor and even a friend. He, um, he introduced me to the people who were at the first three companies I was at. There are many communities out there. I've talked at, at length about one, the Grace Hopper celebration. The reason that it's grown is that so many women come there to find a community that they can talk to, that they can connect to, that they can learn from. But the Grace Hopper celebration and the Anita Borg Institute are only some of the communities that are around out there for you. SWE or the Society for Women Engineers is a great place to go. It's a great community of like-minded people and their conference is a, is a place to come together, to learn, to meet, to connect, and meet other people. And finally, the Tapia Celebration of Diversity and Computing is another conference and community where you can come together, especially for people of color, to find like-minded people, to figure out how to have the, your journey be the, the journey of your dreams. And so in closing, I give you two pieces of advice. One is find your own community. At this point, I belong to many communities and they are all different and they bring a lot of value to my life. I talked a lot about that early community of technical women that played such a fundamental and instrumental role in my early career. And then the other piece of advice I would say is to ask for help. Along the way, I found 
that it was really important to find the people who supported me, but that were experts in fields that I knew nothing about. I mentioned my PhD thesis advisor. He was an important advisor along, along my life's journey, the board of uh, Niederborg Institute, my friends, the community of technical women that are still, many of them are still friends today. It's really important to ask for advice, especially for somebody who knows a lot more about this topic than you do. But in addition to asking for advice, I would also encourage you to give advice. Find the young people that are starting in your organization, the ones that don't have, are too scared to come to you and ask for help. Suggest that you have coffee. Find out what they're about. Find out what's more important. Today, I spend a lot of time mentoring other people whose journeys are amazing, and it's not just for them. I get as much out of the relationship as they do. So ask for advice and give advice. And with that, I hope that all of you have an extraordinary day and that you too find your way of finding community and the ways in which we're better together. Thank you. After five years at IBM, Jennifer Scanlon spent nearly a decade at Bricker & Associates, an operations improvement consulting firm, before joining USG as the Director of Supply Chain Management and later becoming the CEO and President of the manufacturing company. Jennifer now serves as the President and CEO of Underwriters Laboratories. She is the first woman to lead the 125-year-old Safety Science Organization. I'm Jenny Scanlon, CEO and President of UL, the global safety science leader, with operations in 140 markets and 14,000 employees around the world. UL helps create a better world by applying science to solve safety, security, and sustainability challenges. UL is a partner and supporter of Discover E, the parent company of Future City, who was the grand prize winner of the very first UL Innovative Education Award in 2015. I am thrilled to participate in the Global Marathon and support its mission of empowering women in engineering worldwide. I learned at a young age that I was different. I love math. When I said that I absolutely loved math, a lot of people registered surprise. And being different is seldom a comfortable feeling, especially as an awkward teenager. But I found support and I didn't abandon what I loved. My father was a calculus teacher and he was proud of my math skills and interest. He knew the power of math. My mother was an English teacher who quite frankly should have been an engineer. In her day, girls didn't go to engineering school, but her daughter could. Even my younger brother thought it was cool that he could ask me about math stuff. And with time, I found my tribe. Other girls like me who liked and excelled in science and math. One of the cool things my dad did when I was probably starting in fourth grade was hand me a red pen and the answer key for his algebra, algebra two, you know, whatever exams he had given to students. He hated grading papers. Most teachers do, I think. So I had the, this cool opportunity to take the red pen and check people's answers and then put a big star or smiley face on or minus two, and then he'd make me calculate the percentage that they got. So he was teaching me math while I was being his like junior TA. And meanwhile, my mother, who really, um, like I said, she should have been an engineer. The dishwasher would break. She would have it apart in pieces across the kitchen floor and put back together. She is the greatest seamstress, which I really believe is architecture. I mean, when you really think about the skills it takes to make beautiful clothes, she grew up in a world, she didn't have a lot of money, but she could put things together and had this creativity associated with this engineering gene. So she really encouraged us. So it, it came from both sides. And um, we were just forced to, you know, to use, to really do the math as kids. And 
Um, in a lot of cases, you know, it was the only way we were ever going to get anything done. So when I started college, I started out as a math major. And again, back then, there were two women in the honors program of math at University of Notre Dame. We both ended up at IBM, interestingly. Um, I decided I didn't want to take actuarial exams, which is where my professor was steering me. And instead, I shifted into having the minor in computer applications and using that math toward thinking about um, coding and structured programming language and databases and even artificial intelligence back in 1988 when I took that class. And that's what ultimately launched me into IBM, where they just gave the best training and put us through you know, the rigors of the way that, that systems were developed and everything hooked together. That ultimately launched me into consulting, where I joined a firm of former IBMers, a very small firm into management consulting. That launched me into joining one of my clients, USG Corporation, um, to implement a um, ERP system across their North American 70 plant network, which launched me into being chief information officer. And I craved being back on the business side. I missed the revenue generation of my consulting years. I really missed that um, the business problem solving, you know, the technical problem solving is fun, but I love the business problem solving. So I went to my boss and said, listen, I've got plenty of bandwidth right now. Uh, here's some other things I could also do in addition to being CIO. He took me up, he was the COO at the time, took me up on it and asked me to take on corporate strategy. I always joked it was my two jobs for the price of one. It was, you know, the beauty of being in building materials in the middle of the global financial crisis. There, there weren't a lot of, you know, extra dollars floating around. But it was, it was great. It gave me a, a much broader viewpoint and still the opportunity um, to use those, those technical skills. And that's what ultimately launched me into being president of the international division and set me up to be in the running to be CEO at USG. And then now here at UL as president and CEO. So one of the reasons I joined UL was I was very familiar with them because my former company, USG Corporation, which invented sheetrock, was one of UL's oldest customers. So USG first tested sheetrock in the fire testing labs of UL sometime around 1915. So this is the second time that I've been CEO of a 100-plus-year-old company um, with an iconic brand. The exciting thing about the UL brand is I still think we're in our nascent days. And you think about the history and the legacy of the testing for the fire safety and the electrical and... Um, and then you think about all of the new areas of safety that, that the world is just on the precipice of. And, you know, let's start with sustainability or think about, um, I just read a fascinating article about stranded energy in, electronic, in electric batteries, you know, in, in like a Tesla or something. And how do you test for the fact that, that a car that's been in a crash on a highway is safe? to tow away and isn't going to electrocute everybody in, in the arena. So the cool thing about UL is that we were founded to address the cutting edge technology of the day, which was electricity 125 years ago. And we're still here looking at all of those cutting edge technologies of the day and into the future and coming up with new ways to keep people safe um, in these new technological environments. It's just so exciting. I love it. That sense of being different can really be considered a gift. You're embracing something true about yourself that will propel you forward. You'll learn that an ounce of challenge builds pounds of determination. Loving math changed my life and contributed to my success. A few years ago, I was asked to speak at the United Nations on the International Women's Day, and my speech was about encouraging more women to pursue STEM. I quoted that fun film, The Martian, where he said, you do the math. You solve one problem, and then you solve the next problem. That's how Matt Damon's character, Mart Watney, explained escaping a hostile planet and safely returning to Earth. It was the math. Clearly, every engineer has done the math. And you understand its foundational value. You love math because math is about problem solving and business leaders are paid to solve problems. There's significant evidence that I'm a geek. 
I love data. I love math. And fortunately, my parents, who were teachers, taught me that geeks rule the world. And when you think about it, Bill Gates, Warren Buffett, they love math. And they are ruling the world. Being a geek is definitely a plus these days. Not only is math foundational, but it's actually a language. And that's not my term, but it was Galileo's. He said, the great book of nature can be read only by those who know the language in which it is written. And it is this language that is mathematics. If the world can be explained by math, shouldn't we all know that language? I'm especially pleased to be talking to a global audience. I have traveled the world. I've been to over 40 countries, some of them dozens of times. I sit in a lot of meetings where I have translators, where there are cultural differences in the nuances of what's being said. And the elements in those presentations that never have to be translated, it's quite remarkable, are the numbers. The numbers are the numbers are the numbers. And when engineers like you think about what Galileo was saying, you understand the importance of understanding the numbers and having the confidence to use your analytical skills and technological prowess to understand and solve those problems. What a great time in the history of the world to be an engineer. And yet, as women in a male-dominated profession, it's especially important to make your own luck and cultivate and build rich relationships with talented executives, as well as with peers and junior colleagues. I embrace Peter Drucker's axiom that luck is when preparation meets opportunity. I've always done my homework. I focus on being well prepared. And as engineers, you're trained in analysis, in breaking down complexity into smaller elements. And when opportunity comes along, you can seize it. That's what I've done. Now I've taken a few risks here and there. Most of the time it works out because I've prepared for more than one eventuality. And that's it. I've made my own luck. I am a huge believer in mentorships, of mentoring and being a mentee, and the reciprocal nature of that relationship. I also understand what mentoring is not. When I became CEO, I was amazed by the number of women who I didn't know who asked me to mentor them or the fathers of young women who asked me to mentor their daughters who I'd never met. Mentoring is not some magical transfer of power. I've had plenty of highly successful and yes, some even famous mentors. And often these brilliant leaders didn't know that they were my mentors. And that's because I made a practice of watching talented leaders perform adroitly and resolve to learn from their example. As Yogi Berra said, you can learn a lot by just watching. So let me say what a thrill it is to be on the same electronic podium as Telly Whitney, not only a mentor to thousands, but a heroine to engineers, CIOs, and other self-confessed geeks like me. Here's the opportunity. Women engineers, geeks, whatever you wanna call us, we're a unique cohort. Women in engineering have a chance to build and cultivate rich mentoring communities. Believe it or not, there are younger women who would like to learn from you. How many times are you given the opportunity to give a younger colleague a boost? It can be as simple as a word of encouragement or a compliment on their contribution. Think of how it would have lifted you. As you move along in your career, keep your eye on those young talents who might need a word of encouragement. You have no idea the impact of helping a younger colleague. She may eventually be the talent you need in the future. She may eventually be your boss. By taking advantage of mentoring moments, you're building a community of supporters. Don't overlook the mentors who are close by. I do take very deeply my role as being a mentor to 14,000 plus employees. And one of the neat things that my predecessor had done that, that I've decided to continue is send an email to every employee every week. 
And on one hand, that's a big burden to think about what what are 14,000 people going to want to hear this week? On the other hand, it's a great way for me to really let people know, here's what's on my mind that I think is, is relevant to you. And if it's not relevant to you, I'd like it to be relevant to you. So think about this. And I've gotten just really terrific feedback from various employees around the world. Every week, I never know who I'm going to hear from, but I usually hear from at least a half a dozen people um, who've read it, thought about it, and taken it to heart. Um, So like this week was on customer centricity and how do you ensure, no matter who you are, that you're keeping the customer at the center of what you do? Well, walk in their shoes. I think that's great advice when you think about a mentor is walk in their shoes as well. Think about how if they were in your job and got to their job, what path do you think they took? Walk in their shoes for the choices that they made or didn't make. And then walk in their shoes for if you were in their shoes, what would you be concerned about about your organization? And if you were in their shoes, what would you want to know about the things that are going on in your in your department or your customers or your job. And the reason why I say that is because I think when you then have the courage or you want to ask somebody to be a mentor, it has to be a two-way street. It has to be that they get something out of the relationship as well as you. It can't just be this magical because you had a cup of coffee with somebody, you transferred power or you know whatever. It has to be that, that each side learns something. And I think those people who have come to me and asked me to be a formal mentor, the ones that have worked out that I've enjoyed have been because I've learned something from them in the process and they've learned something from me and it's a genuine exchange. I think the hardest part for leaders as you progress in your career is people stop telling you things. And so there's real power in those mentoring relationships where you have a mentee who's willing to tell you some things that other people have stopped telling you. My first and lifelong mentor is my Aunt Louise, my mother's younger sister. Louise is 20 years older than I am, and so in some ways she's more like an older sister. She was an executive at IBM when there were few women in leadership roles. She used her job opportunities as a chance to be strong and purposeful. She never worried about being one of the few women in the room. And over the years, she saw that there were more women by her side. She did her work exceedingly well, and she always believed that wherever she was promoted, it wasn't because she was a woman, but it was because she was the best person for the job. That's always my advice. Position yourself to be the best one for that job. Be confident, ask for it. Be able to calmly explain your strengths, and look around. There are people like my aunt in your family, in your friend group, in this room, on your teams. Pay attention. Mentors are all around you, whether or not they know it. Don't miss the opportunity to learn from them. Your responsibilities as a mentor or a mentee continue throughout your career. As you move into the ranks of senior leaders, you can have a huge impact The power that we as women have to put our hand on the shoulder of another woman and say, this is an opportunity, you should do this. When you are the recipient, take it seriously, be gracious, and commit to pay it forward when the time comes. How do you become identified as an individual who has promise? I say, be curious. The more curiosity that you display on a daily basis, the more energy and the more visibility you will ultimately have. Curiosity sets you up for more opportunities to meet your preparation and thereby help you make your own luck. Own your strength. You're trained and you're talented and you're a member of an August community. You're operating at a time when analytical skills are in demand. Celebrate who and where you are. As Oscar Wilde once said, be yourself. Everyone else is already taken. Thank you and have fun making your own luck. Success is stumbling from failure to failure with no loss of enthusiasm. 
Courage is the most important of all virtues because without courage, you can't practice any other virtue consistently. Nothing in the world can take the place of persistence. Persistence and determination alone are omnipotent. The slogan, press on, has solved and always will solve the problems of the human race. There are too many quotes that I could leave you with. So instead, let me simply say this. I hope that you've enjoyed the 2020 Global Marathon as much as I have and that you've learned some actionable tips and advice to help you persist and succeed.